Welcome to the very special edition of TypeScript Berlin Meetup, where we join forces with the TypeScript uh, Sevilla Meetup group, connecting TypeScript devs across the continent. I'm your host, Daniel, and today we have three outstanding speakers and some really nice surprises. And uh, let me introduce our speakers. So our speakers for today will be Tizian Serichova Dragomir, who will talk about understanding variants in the TypeScript type system. His talk will be followed by Dylan Megida, uh, sorry, Dillian Megida, who will give a presentation titled Prop Types versus TypeScript. And that will be followed um, by our final talk for today by Kayetan uh, Swiatek, who will introduce us to Elm, a delightful language for learning functional programming. Now, we'll also be running a quiz throughout the event. And um, you can do that by, you can join this qu uh, the quiz by scanning the QR code or entering the link uh, uh, that you can see in the browser. And you can do this already uh, now. The quiz will run throughout the event. So keep the Slido page open and the questions will appear as uh, we activate them. And the questions will relate to the content of the talks. Uh, and the quicker you answer the questions, the higher your chances of winning. Now, our first prize uh, will be a license for a JetBrains product of your choice. And in case you're not familiar, JetBrains produces a lot of really nice developer tools and uh, a code editor that works with .NET, C++, Java, JavaScript, PHP, Python, and other languages. Uh, and so I highly recommend that. Um, and then that will be followed up by uh, the second prize who will receive a copy of 50 Lessons in TypeScript, a book by Steven Baumgartner, and you can get that either as an ebook or a paper copy. And finally, uh, the third place will win a Prisma swag pack. So you will get a t-shirt and some stickers. Now we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. And I see that some of you have already answered. So we have people joining from Poland, Berlin, uh, Krakow in Poland. We have Lille in France, Bielefeld in Germany. Um, yeah, there's a very famous joke about Bielefeld that it doesn't really exist. So, uh, I'm glad to find out that it does indeed exist. And I see now we have more joining from Stockholm, Bangkok. Um, we also had a speaker at the previous, uh, meetup at the previous TypeScript. Uh, his name is, I think is Poom. So if that's you, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and wow. Yeah. So we're really South Africa. Nairobi, Kenya. So really lovely to see all of you joining in. Let's see. Okay. Seattle. So we've, we're covering already, uh, three, four continents, India. I hope, uh, send in, uh, my heartfelt wishes to everyone in India right now. And let's continue. So our next question is, what technologies do you use in your stack? Um, this is the TypeScript meetup. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see TypeScript, but uh, I'm sure that there's other technologies being used. Uh, you can share your libraries, uh, the database that you use, the programming language. Uh, it's all interesting. Great. So we have some, oh yeah, I, I, I like the answer. Only the best ones. Great, so TypeScript is indeed the leader. We've got some Python, TypeORM, Apollo Client and Server, React, Terraform, AWS, Nest. Wow, this is really interesting to see this. Oh, we even have Blitz.js, Svetler, NX, Office.js. Okay, very interesting. So. Thank you. Oh, okay. Even FPTS, which is, I think, a, a functional programming library for TypeScript. Kubernetes, Spring Boot. Okay. And obviously TypeScript is our main one. So thank you all for participating. Now I would like to introduce our very first speaker for today. And that is Tizian Serichova Dragomir, who will help us understand variants in the TypeScript type system in his presentation. 
Uh, Tizian is an engineer at Bloomberg, working on TypeScript and JavaScript infrastructure. He is also a TypeScript compiler contributor, as well as being one of the top answerers with regard to TypeScript on Stack Overflow. And of course, as you can imagine, he's a huge fan of TypeScript, and he will try to convince you that you should be one too. So now, without any further delay, I bring you Tizian. Hello, Tizian. Hello, everybody. Uh... Once you're ready to share your screen, I think we can. Uh, yeah, um... I'm getting ready to share. And here we have it. OK, Tizian, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about variants in the TypeScript type system today. Um, so we will first of all talk about how variants, uh, what variance means, and we're going to relate this to a, to a generic type. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, how TypeScript actually uses variance internally and how that actually surfaces in, in, inside TypeScript. And we should also see exactly why should actually care about this. And you, so you, I hope that I will manage to convince you that uh, variance is not just some arcane type theory thing, and it's actually something with real world impact that you should care about. So we're going to start off with a little bit of a tangent. Um, we're going to ask a simple question. How can we tell if something is a base type of another type? So in other languages, this might be simple. In C Sharp, for example, or in other nominal type languages, you might just look at the base type and, and you, would, you would find exactly what the, uh, what the base type of, of, of a class is. In TypeScript, it's a little bit more complicated since TypeScript is structurally typed. So a type can have a multitude of, uh, of, base, uh, of base types. So how can we tell if something is a base type? Well, the proxy we're going to use today is assignability. Now, assignability is not a perfect proxy for, for, a subtype, for the subtyping relationship. There is something called excess property checks that is uh, not, a, not part of subtyping, but it's generally a, a pretty good proxy, and we're going to use it in, in this presentation. Uh, we're also use, gonna use conditional, we could have also used conditional types, but the syntax there is a bit more wonky and I think people are more comfortable with, uh, with assignability. So when, uh, when is something a base type? Well, if we have, generally if we have a subtype of something and we try to assign it to, to a reference that is typed as a base type, that assignment su should succeed. So what does this have to do with variance? Well, at its core, Variance is a way to, to uh, gain insight into a subtyping relationship. Basically, if we have a generic type, let's call it list, and it, this type has a, a type parameter, and we instantiate this type with, uh, with, two, with two other types that we know are related, the question becomes, are list, is list of those two types related in any way? For example, if we, if we have a dog, which is, uh, which is a subtype of animal. And we instantiate list with animal and, and list with dog. Are those two types related in any way? And the answer is that they can be. And the ways that they're rela rela related gives us the variance of, uh, of that type of parameter. For example, we could have <clears throat> the arrow of inheritance pointing in the same direction for these two instantiations. So if we have dog, which is a subtype of animal, then list of dog is going to be a subtype of list of animal. And this, of course, also means the related assignability. Namely, we can assign a list of dog to anywhere a list of animal is expected, but not the other way around. Contravariance, contra meaning opposite, right? The arrow of inheritance points in the opposite direction. That means if we have our same example with dog is a subtype of, uh, of animal, if we instantiate list and list is contra contravariant, then we actually get the fact that list of animal is a subtype of list of dog. And also the assignability is reversed. Right now we can assign a list of animal to anywhere a list of dog is expected, but not the other way around. The third type of variance is bivariance, right? Namely, the arrow of inheritance points in both, direc in both directions. This means that both list of animal is a subtype of list of dog, and list of dog is a subtype of list of animal. 
And this might seem a little bit strange at first. And in most other languages, this would actually indicate that we're probably doing something wrong. Either we're not, prob we're not using that type parameter or dog and animal are actually the same type or some other strange corner case. In TypeScript, this actually has a pretty uh, common use and we're going to see exactly what, what uh, makes bivariance in TypeScript, right? Also assignability, since the type uh, is bivariant and list of dog is a subtype of list of animal and the other way around, assignability can happen in both directions. So we have a list of dog is assignable to list of animal and list of animal is assignable to list of dog, right? We, get, we don't get errors on either one of those. And the final type of variance is, well, no variance at all in variance. There is no arrow of inheritance between the two, the two instantiations of list, right? This means that we cannot assign a list of animal to list of dog or the other way around. There is simply no relationship between those, those two types. Okay, so we've seen a bit of theory. Now, the next question I think is, is, is fair to ask is, what, what gives a type parameter its variance? And I would like for us to try to form a little, an intuition about, uh, about variance and to, to sort of be able to deduce on our own when something is, uh, is covariant or contravariant or, or something else. And the basic question we have to ask ourselves when trying to figure this out is, is it safe? Right. Now, TypeScript is not always safe, and people who probably already know a little bit about variants are going to scream at me, scream at their screens, because I'm going to simple, oversimplify some things over the next uh, couple of examples. But I promise we will add the complexity a bit later. But for now, let's start with the following supposition. The position in which a type parameter is used will have an impact on variants. And let's see some or some examples of how a type parameter can be used. So I have some sample code here. These are our sample classes, very basic. We have an animal base class and dog and cat are subtypes of animal, each with their own, their own method and, and fields. And we're going to start out with a simple example. Let's assume we have an interface that we're going to call cage that has a read-only field of type animal. And let's see if we can intuit what the variance of cage is. So the first question we can, the first thing we do here is we create a new dog cage. And let's, let's see, can we assign a dog cage to an animal cage? Well, TypeScript seems to think this is fine. And let's analyze it a little bit. I mean, if we have cage and we access the animal field, we can only access Wait, we can't access any of dog's methods, but that seems fine. That's generally how aliasing through a base type works. You, you, what you can do with the the result is more restrictive. If we try to assign the animal, for example, if we try to assign a new cat here, well, the field is read only, so we can't do the assignment. So this again seems safe. So there's nothing unsafe we can do if this assignment is allowed. So we can deduce here that this covariant assignment is allowed. So this field is, uh, this usage of T is covariant. Let's see if the other way, or if, if, if it is also contravariant. Now, if we have a cat, a uh, variable of, of type cat cage, can we assign an animal, uh, can we assign an animal cage to it? Well, TypeScript doesn't allow this. It doesn't think this is safe. And the reason for that is, is quite simple. I mean, here we have, we've aliased our, our dog cage. So now in our animal cage, there is a dog, but here we assigned it to a cat cage. So now we're going to tell our animal to play or treating our, our dog like a cat. So that's probably not going to work and we're going to get a runtime error because of this. So, Field positions are not uh, read-only field positions are only covariant. Okay, that seems simple enough. Let's see another uh, position we can use a, a, a type parameter in. What about as a return type? So here we have an interface with a method that returns uh, an instance of its type parameter. And let's say we, we create a new, uh, a new object and we return a new dog from our, from our create method. Is covariant assignment safe? 
can we assign a dog mother to an animal mother? Well, if we invoke the method, the actual implementation will be returning a dog. We can't access any of the dog methods since we aliased it through, through this uh, base class field. We can only access weight, but again, that's fine. It's not unsafe, it's just we can do less. What about the other way around? Is that safe? Well, if we try to, uh, to assign an animal mother to a cat mother, TypeScript tells us this is not okay. And if we think of, about it, yes, it's not because create will return something that we will think is a, is, a, is a cat and we will treat it as such. So we're treating again our, our cat, uh, our dog, we're, tre we're treating it as a cat. So not safe, right? So return types are covariant. What other types, what other positions could we use our parameter in? Well, another very obvious one is as a, uh, as a parameter type. So let's say we have a new interface. We'll call it Groomer. It's uh, an interface that whose implementation will cut, cut the hair of an animal. We create here a, a new dog groomer. And we first of all tell our dog to bark. And then we cut its hair. So let's see. Is it safe to assign, uh, to assign a dog groomer to an animal groomer? Is it safe to assign covariantly? Well. TypeScript doesn't think so. And if we try, for example, to invoke the method, since now the method accepts any animal, we could potentially pass in a cat here. So now the implementation, which is expecting a dog, is going to have to deal with a cat. And it's going to tell our, our cat to bark. And cats don't bark. And it's probably going to claw you if you try to make it bark. So. Definitely, this is not safe. So parameter positions are not covariant, right? We cannot safely assign a dog groomer to an animal groomer. What about the other way around? If we create a, an animal groomer that can groom any animal, right? Let's say the, uh, the cut hair method, first of all, weighs the animal, it prints out the weight, and then it proceeds to cut the hair. Is this safe? Well, if we assign our animal groomer to, to a cat groomer, what can we do here? Well, we can only invoke the cut hair method with a cat, but our implementation can deal with any animal. So this is safe. It's again, more restrictive, which we, will, we would expect from a, an assignment to a base type, but it, ca it's not, it, it cannot result in a runtime error. So what we can deduce from this is that covariant assignment is not safe for parameter, but contravariant assignment is valid, is, is safe. So parameter, uh, parameter types are contravariant. Now, as a general rule of thumb for variance, uh, we, can, we can think of it like this. If it comes out of the implementation, such, for example, as the return time of, of a method or a read-only field, then it's going to be covariant. If it goes into the implementation, right, like the, par the parameter type, the parameter, then it's going to be contravariant. And actually, some languages codify this in syntax. For example, C sharp uh, actually has this, an explicit covariance and contravariance annotations. For example, I enumerable is a is a interface that produces uh, elements of type T, so it's covariant and it's annotated without. Or, for example, a uh, function signature such as action is annotated with in meaning, uh, for its parameter types, meaning that it's going to be contravariant. Now, TypeScript doesn't have an explicit annotation for variance. Its, its variance is determined by position, just as we've seen. Um, and let's see if our intuition holds up with what TypeScript actually does in, in, in practice. So for fields, TypeScript for read-only fields, TypeScript indeed considers those as covariant. Now, the problem is that it also considers mutable fields as covariant. What does this mean in practice? Well, consider our first example with our cage. We said that this is safe because we cannot assign the animal field because it's read-only. But if we remove the read-only modifier, then this assignment is still safe 
because mutable fields are covariant. However, we end up assigning an animal, we end up assigning, assigning a cat to what used to be a dog cage. So if we were to access, for example, dog cage, animal.bark, we are now telling our cat to bark. And again, probably not, the cat is not going to be very happy to do so. So field, mutable fields are, can be an issue. They're covariant, even though that is not safe. Return types, TypeScript considers covariant, which is the same as our intuition said. And mm, let's see parameter types. Now this is where it gets a little bit messy. As we've seen, types, uh, parameter types seem to be contravariant, but only when strict function types is turned on and only within function signatures, right? Now, I'm not gonna consider the case without, without function signatures. I hope everybody's using strict or some version of strict at least. But if strict function types is off, then parameter, uh, parameter types are bivariant. And if you use strict, it doesn't mean you, you get away without knowing what bivariance is because method signatures are always bivariant. So what does bivariance mean? Well, if, for example, we take our parameter, our parameter example, right? Our groomer example, you will see here that I cheated a little bit. This isn't actually a, me a method. It's a field that happens to be a function. If I wanted this to be, a to be a method, I should have written it like this. Remember, like I said, methods treat their parameters as bivariant always. This means that now we can assign our dog groomer to an animal groomer, as well as the other way around, which is safe. And now we can end up with our dog groomer being expected to groom a cat. So definite runtime, uh, definitely we could get runtime issues from, from this code. So, why is parameter variance such a mess, right? So we see that it's both unsafe and there's all sorts of weird options that you have to fiddle and there's three cases. Well, initially all parameters were bivariant. This was done uh, from what I've, I've been able to piece together because it's easier to migrate from JavaScript if, if this is true, right? Starting out with, with TypeScript, a lot of JavaScript developers didn't have to worry about, about assignability that much. So this was a good compromise for, for uh, at the beginning. Now in 2017, TypeScript added this strict function types option. And like I said, this option only affects function of parameter types in function signatures. And from the PR that introduces this is that uh, it says that methods are are excluded specifically to ensure generic classes and interfaces, such as array, continue to mostly relate covariantly. So what does this mean? What, what does Anders try to say here in, in this PR? What would happen if array were to actually, uh, if all methods were to actually relate, uh, contravari uh, relate contravariantly, if my, my method parameter types were to relate contravariantly? Let's have a look at how array behaves currently in TypeScript. So let's say we have a dog array and we can take that dog array and assign it to an animals array because array relates covariantly. Is this safe? Not really because we can not now push in our animals array a new cat but our originally our dogs array, but we were just aliasing a dogs array. So for example, now if we were to process all of our dogs, one of them would actually be a cat. So in our dog array, we've mixed both cat and dogs and I don't think they're gonna be very happy to sit one next to the other. The other way around is not safe, but that's fine. That's, that's, that's the way it should be. So what would happen if method parameters were to be more strict? And I've taken the liberty here of creating an interface. I called it mutable array. And I've converted all of the method signatures to 
uh, function signatures, just as we did for our, for our groomer example. And let's see what happens. Now, since TypeScript uses uh, this parameter both in, in, in a, since we use this parameter both in a covariant position and a contravariant position, the result is going to be that our uh, interface is going to be invariant. So what is invariance? Invariance is if we use a, a type parameter in both covariant and contravariant positions. This means that assignability between different instantiations of array becomes totally impossible, right? You cannot assign a dog's array to a cat, to an animal array or the other way around. Is this safer? Yes, definitely. Is this developer friendly? Arguably not. Most people would expe expect this assignment to succeed. We, to, uh, to be able to assign a dog's array to an animal's array. So could we build safer arrays? Could we build arrays that are strictly covariant or contravariant? Well, as we've seen, covariant variance is determined by the position in which the type is used. So if we were to take each method of, uh, of, our, of our mutable array interface, we could decide in which one of these two it should be. For example, the pop method. It returns something of the same param of, of the T parameter type, right? Return type covariant. So this means it goes into our covariant interface. What about concat? Well, concat uses T both as a parameter type and as a return type. So concat is invariant as a method. It, it cannot uh, appear in either of them. It would make the interfaces invariant as well. Push accepts uh, a parameter of type T. This means it's going to go in the contravariant, uh, contravariant array bucket. Join doesn't accept, uh, doesn't use T at all, so it can easily go in both. And we have another, uh, several other methods that are all covariant because the the return type, the type, the parameters appear, uh, the type parameters appears as the return type. Now, what about sort? Now, I said that if the type parameters type parameter appears as a parameter type, then it's contravariant. But here it's a, it's a bit more complicated. It's not directly in a type in the parameter type. It's in another. It's in a function signature that appears as a parameter type. Now we can fall back to our intuition. Right? I said that if it goes into the the, the implementation, it's it's uh, it's contravariant. If it comes out of the implementation, it's covariant. Well, in this case, okay, we are passing a function. To, to the sort method, and that does go into the, 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 the array implementation. But then the array implementation itself calls our function with these two parameters. So we get access to something that comes out of our implementation, out of the array implementation. So this means that the, this appearance of, of uh, the parameter t is actually covariant, right? Because we get access to it from the outside. It comes to us from the outside. We don't pass it in. We don't pass uh, values of type T in, into the implementation. So this also goes into our covariant array bucket. Index of parameter, it, uh, the type appears in, in as a type, para, as a, the parameter to, to a method. So it definitely goes in the contra array, contravariant array bucket. Okay, now uh, I get this, uh, when I've explained this before, people tend to associate covariance with read-only and contravariance with write-only. That's not really what, what's uh, the way we should think about it. In and out doesn't mean read-only and write-only. And as we see here, both, the inter both interfaces contain uh, write methods and, uh, and read-only methods. Index of is definitely a read-only operation, but it's still, uh, it's still contravariant. So have we actually succeeded? Are these methods, are these new interfaces uh, covariant and contravariant? Well, for our covariant array, we see that yes, indeed, we can assign the animal, the animal array to 
uh, sorry, the dog array to an animal array. And it's actually safe now. There's nothing we can do with our animal uh, with our animals array that would result in us introducing a cat into uh, into the array. Right? Pop is it can change, but it can't add. It only removes uh, it removes animals from our array, and so do all of the other methods that that are mutating methods. So it's safely covariant. Our covariant array is definitely not contravariant, which is which is great. What about our contravariant uh, example, our contravariant array? Well, we can't assign our dog array to an animals array, which is what we expected. But if we were to have an animals array, we can assign it to a cat's array. And here we can see that it is, uh, we can use the push method to push in a new cat. But since the the animals is, is supposed to be just an animals array and not something more specific, then this should be safe. Okay. Now I'd like to talk a, a little bit more about uh, about uh, how this uh, how variance relates to to types. So we all know that if we have if we have to, if we have types in 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 TypeScript, all of the, all types have one base uh, have a universal base type, and that's unknown, right? There's all the base type of any type in the type system is unknown. It's a universal base type. Now, there's also a universal subtype, and that's called never. Never is the subtype of any other type in the type system by definition. Now, this also means that we can actually assign, if we have a variable of type never, we can assign it to any other type, right? So we can assign a variable of type never to a variable of type dog. And this is something that usually trips people up because never is seen more as an error type. It's not. It's just the subtype of everything else. Now, let's see how this relates to our, for example, our covariant array example. Now. Let's see if we can express the base type of all covariant array instantiations. What would be the base type of that? Well, since the arrow of inheritance points in the same direction, the base type for, for covariant array of dog or and covariant array of cat would be covariant array of unknown, right? This would be the, uh, the we can assign a covariant array of dog to a covariant array of unknown, and the same for cat. And what is the universal uh, subtype? Well, that's going to be covariant array of never, right? So covariance respects the same relationships with regard to unknown and never. What about contravariant array? What would be the universal base type of that? Well, since we are dealing with contravariance, right? That means that, for example, if we if we thought that covariant array of unknown was the base type, that's actually not true, right? The arrow of inheritance points in the opposite direction. So that means that actually covariant array of unknown is the subtype of all covariant array uh, instantiations. What is the base type? Well, that's actually going to be covariant array of never. So if we want to have a type that we can always assign an, a covariant array of, of uh, dog or cat too, that's going to be covariant array of never. So for example, if we want to say have a function print that accepts the covariant, uh, the contravariant array, if we were to use unknown here, we would see that we actually can't pass in a cat array, we can't actually pass in a dog array, we can't even pass in an animals array. We can't pass in anything because actually this is the subtype of all of these. If we were to pass in covariant array of never, then yes, this is the type which we can always assign another contravariant array to. Okay, so does TypeScript actually care about variance? I mean, it's obviously an emergent property in the type system, right? It definitely has impact. But does TypeScript actually use this in any way? Well, there's two ways that TypeScript definitely uses this. First of all is the error messages. If we were to look at our, our covariant and contravariant array examples, 
we would see, uh, let's actually first of all look at our invariant arrays. Let's see what kind of errors we get here, right? It's uh, one of those wonderful error pyramids. And it, it actually ends up reporting an error on a random method. Here it's concat because in order that was the one that ended up being the first one not to, to, to be assignable. But for example, for, for cat, it actually pop. That is the first one that is, is not compatible and an error is reported on this. It's not a particularly great way to express, to express errors. For covariant array, we see that the error message is much nicer. We actually see that, okay, we get the top line error, and then it says directly that animal is not assignable to cat. Since it's since this is what TypeScript has deduced, that must happen, right? If covariant array is, is covariant, then for, for, for the arrays to be assignable, then animal would have to be assignable to cat. So much nicer error messages. What about for contravariant? Now here we see that we have uh, we have the same assignability error. We have that dog is not assignable to uh, contravariant array of dog is not assignable to contravariant array of animal. But then we see that here the assignability error is reversed, right? It says that animal is not assignable to dog. And this is quite commonly what uh, uh, something that trips people up when they see this error. They think that it might be a compiler bug. No, it's actually just an expression of variance because uh, for this for the first assignment, for, for this assignment to succeed, it's not that dog uh, has to be assignable to animal, it's the other way around. Animal has to be assignable to dog. So this is why we get the, the, the types reversed in the error messages. And TypeScript also uses covariance as an optimization to structural type checking. Structural type checking is very expensive, right? Checking all properties is not trivial for, for an instantiation of a generic type. But generally, if TypeScript can know that the specific variance of a type, and that's not always possible, it can sort of short circuit this. It can just say, okay, if I have this covar this uh, uh, this generic type, and I know its variance, I can just relate the type parameters. I don't have to go through all of the whole type uh, structural type checking thing. Now this can go wrong, sometimes wrong, and I've actually reported uh, recently a bug that uh, is specifically about this. If you you search for it, it you'll see it's uh, it's very interesting in, in my in my opinion. But generally, this is something that that TypeScript does, and if you build a strictly covariant or contravariant type, it will actually be faster in in checking that. So I know what you're probably thinking right about now is, okay, but I don't use generics that much. Does this really matter? The answer is yes, because even though we've talked about variance mostly in terms of generic types, actually variance uh, applies to all type relationships. So the, the positions that we've discovered that uh, govern uh, how variance looks like in, in TypeScript, actually apply when TypeScript tries to relate all types. What do I mean by this? So for example, let's say we have a, 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 an interface. It's a state machine. It has a function that's called set state that accepts two states, started and stopped. Now we also have a function that calls, that accepts an object that has a method that accept, that accepts uh, one of these three states, started, stopped, and paused, and evokes this method, method with paused. And now we create a new state machine. And let's see, if we were to call move to paused state on our new state machine that only accepts started and stopped as, an, as, as a state, does type to complain? Nope. TypeScript allows this. Why? Because methods relate bivariantly. Method, uh, method parameter types relate bivariantly. So this means that as long as there is a relationship between this parameter and this parameter type, it doesn't matter what that relationship is. It can go in either direction. TypeScript will still be happy. Now, if there's no overlap between the two, then yes, we would get an error. But as long as there is some sort of relationship, TypeScript is happy. Can we fix this? Well, if we were to use a function signature instead, then yes, TypeScript does complain. So this is a place where the fact that method parameter types relate 
bivariantly results in, in uh, something that could be a runtime error. Let's look at a similar example. Let's say we have our state machine, and this time we have a field. The field is not read-only, right? And our move to state uh, to pause state method um, function accepts, again, a field that has uh, a state that is similar, but it also accept, accepts paused. Now, since function fields relate covariantly, this means that we can actually assign our state machine to this move to pause state function. And this is actually a harder uh, issue to solve because mutable fields always relate covariantly. There is actually no switch to turn this off, unfortunately. And actually, the only thing is can do, we can do is to actually make this, uh, this read-only. And then we don't. We actually would get an error. We try to assign it, but this is something that we, as the implementer of the function, need to need to take care of, right? So there are definitely issues that you will have, and places where you will, will fall off the the safety, uh, the safety of that types of provides. And a lot of the, these times, variances are the root cause, and the way TypeScript deals with variances are the root cause of it. So some conclusions. Uh, yes, I still actually like TypeScript. Uh, I know I've I've been sort of uh, pointing out some of its flaws, but I think that's also important. We have to know what the the limits of type safety is in TypeScript and know where we're about to fall off the edge with something. This may improve in the future. Who knows? Maybe in two years, most of this talk is going to be obsolete. I hope so. But for now, here are some recommendations to, to make sure that you don't fall off the edge with regard to type safety. First recommendation would be prefer read-only fields. Right? We saw that read-only fields relate covariantly, and that is safe. Mutable fields relate covariantly, and that is not safe. Prefer function signatures to methods. We saw that method sign signatures are always bivariant, while function signatures do actually respect variance more, more closely. And think about variants in your inter when you build interfaces. Try to make them either co or contravariant. And if that's not possible, at least make it invariant. If they can't relate, that is still safe, although it might be a pain for your users. Also, avoid making bivariant interfaces, because since assignability can go in either direction, usually that is a recipe for, for runtime errors. Um, that being said, thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Also, if you'd like to read more about uh, TypeScript adoption at Bloomberg, there is a very nice article from, from one of my colleagues, which I encourage you to, to go off and read. Thank you very much. Thank you, Titian. That was quite insightful. Um, and I think there's a lot to unpack there, uh, certainly for me. Um, so. I think this is a great moment uh, to take questions. So if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And um, okay, so we have the first question from Orta Therox. Hello, Orta. Do you prefer contravariance or meta slug, uh, meta <laughs> slug variants? <laughs> okay. I actually have not heard of meta slug variants, but that's a much cooler name. <laughs> So Orta, please uh, do share more information. We want to know. Uh, John Riley is asking, also, uh, he's saying awesome talk. Uh, couldn't agree any more. Is there a good way to reference, uh, a good way reference to turn to when making your code more variant? Um, I, I don't know of one. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, most of the things I, I present here are sort of some of his personal experience and things I've noticed. So. It's sort of fresh material, but uh, I think that everybody can think about about this. You know, once you sort of have the vocabulary for it, you can start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, <laughs> we had a so John Riley just said, that, "Will you write it?" <laughs> <laughs> I have a sort of very long list of blog posts I would like to write. I haven't written any of them, so. I'm, I'm not particularly hopeful that I will get around to doing that, but uh, I, that's, I, that's actually a very interesting topic that I might actually manage to, to put pen and paper to. 
Do you mind sharing maybe two other topics that you would love to address in one of your blog posts? Uh, actually, none come to mind right now. Um, let me see. Um, I think uh, conditional types and again, distributive conditional types is something that people are always tripped up by. And I might be late to the party here, but uh, I think this, the the new support for for string literal type manipulation in, in TypeScript is also awesome. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of other people have covered that as well. So I'm not sure if if I would have any more insight to bring to to that. So yeah, I believe we had a great uh, talk from one of the Spotify engineers at one of the previous meetups, exactly about uh, string literals, uh, string literal types. Okay, we had a couple. Uh, we had another question from Jakub who asked, how does it work in other languages like PureScript? Are you familiar with PureScript? Um, I'm not year? familiar with PureScript, so I can't, I can't comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, so the, most, the language I'm most comfortable with is, is C Sharp, other than, than TypeScript. So in C Sharp, there's, most things are actually invariant. And uh, for classes, you can specify that interfaces are co- or contravariant, and you have those explicit annotations but it's it's definitely more strict than than typescript is i see and uh were you were you using c sharp prior to typescript or were you sort of learning both in parallel oh there was a good time there was a good period where i where i used both uh i think it's it quite a long a long time i don't know four or five years i used them, them in parallel uh, it's i think for the past three or four years i've been exclusively in, in typescript mm -hmm. And one final uh, question, Diego is asking, do you miss explicit variance keywords? Uh, well, in, in TypeScript, the only thing that would happen is that you would get errors if you weren't respecting those because the position determines it anyway. I don't know, I don't, I don't miss it because actually in C-sharp, it's not common to use them, mostly because uh, Thing, people don't expect assignability to be so easy there. There's a lot of lots of time where things just aren't assignable and everybody's fine with that. I think coming from JavaScript is sort of the, the there's there's more demand there for things to just work, mm. you know, and uh, that is I think why the rules around variants are more relaxed in, in TypeScript than they are in, in, in C sharp, for example. I see. Gotcha. Okay, let's, um, I think we can now uh, do the uh, last part, which will be the quiz uh, for your talk. Uh, do you want to stick around, Titian? Yeah, okay. sure. Okay, all right. Um, so, our very first question, and you can join the quiz if you haven't already by scanning the QR code or by uh, entering TypeScript at slido.com. And I'll wait there for a couple of seconds. Let some more of you join. A uh, quick reminder, the first prize will be a JetBrains license for a product of uh, theirs of your choice. The second prize will be a uh, book uh, on TypeScript, 50 Lessons on TypeScript, I believe it's called. And then the third prize is uh, a Prisma Swag Pack. Cool. So thank you all for joining. The quicker you answer, as I mentioned, uh, the higher the chances of winning. Okay. And let's get right into it. So uh, the first, uh, wait. the first question is method signature parameters are covariant. Second choice is contravariant under strict function types, bivariant otherwise or third bivariant? Okay. And I'll close this in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I think this was the... Uh, and then the next question is function signature parameters are covariant. Second choice is contravariant under strict function types, bivariant otherwise. And finally, bivariant. Okay, I'll wait another five seconds. OK. 
Okay. And then we have the question, if list um, generic parameter t is invariant, then list dog is the base type of list animal. Second choice, list animal is the base type of list dog. And third, there is no subtype relationship between list animal and list dog. And I'll give this another couple of seconds. All right. So this is the last question of this section. If for list T we have list animal is a base type of list dog, then first choice is T is only used in a covariant position. Second, T is used in a covariant or bivariant position. And third, T is only used in a contravariant position. And I'll close this off. Let's see if we can get this. Let's see if we can get the uh, results. Okay, so indeed T is used in the covariant position. And our current leaderboard is as such. So Andre D is uh, leading, followed by Kuba and Diego V. You should also be able to see the answers in the quiz. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Tizian, for joining us. Greatly appreciated. Thank you for having me. It's, it's been fun, and I hope everybody uh, found the talk interesting. <laughs> cool. OK, so we now come to the uh, second talk. And our next speaker is uh, Dillian Megida, uh, in case you're not familiar. Dillian is a software engineer at this dot and a technical writer at many publications. He is passionate about learning, building, and simplifying topics around the web via articles and videos. And his talk title today is Prop Types versus TypeScript. So on that note, let's bring Dylan to the stage. Welcome, Hi everyone. Dillian. You ready to share your screen? Yes, I'm on it. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep, I'll share that right away. And we're live. We've got the 80s infinite loop hip. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, the stage is yours, Dillian. Okay, hello everyone. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So, in my my name is Dillion. I'm a software engineer at this dot, and I'm a technical writer at so many places. And in my talk today, I'll be talking about TypeScript versus prop types in respect to React applications. And this is what we'll be covering. So, we'll be looking at props in React briefly, and then we we'll look at prop types for props type checking and then TypeScript for prop type checking. We'll look at the similarities between prop types and TypeScript, and then the differences between prop types and TypeScript. And in this section five, we'll also understand scenarios where you may want to use prop types over TypeScript, or where you may want to prefer TypeScript over prop types. And then lastly, we'll look at how to combine prop types and TypeScript in your application without repeating type declarations. So let's get started. And firstly, what is props in React? And props is a very familiar term in so many frameworks, Angular, Vue, React, and props are just like inputs, similar to attributes of HTML elements. They are inputs of a component that sometimes determines the returned React element. So as we can see in this small component here, this is a component and then it has four inputs, which is four properties. And the first one is a BG color. The second one is an app name. The third one is items. And the last one is age. And these four properties are grouped into a property object. You can call it property, but usually it's called props. And that prop object is just like a regular JavaScript object. And just like JavaScript object, every 
property in an object can have different types of values. BG color here has a string, items here has an array, AG here has a number. But then how do we ensure that the expected type for a prop is passed to that component or a prop is indeed provided? Now, why is this relevant? Say, for example, in this component, you are doing a BG color dot to, upper, to upper case. If you pass in a number to this component and you try to call it to upper case method on that number, that will break the application. So we have to ensure that when a component is expecting a string, it gets that string. And we do that by type checking props. And just like we'll see in this talk, you can type check with prop types and you can type check with TypeScript. So prop types for type checking. Prop types is a library. This is prop types right here. Prop types is a library used for declaring types for your props in React applications. And you can do that in various ways. You can declare array prop types. You can declare a Boolean type, a function type, a number type, a string type, a React element type, so many types as you may want. But then type checking when using prop types occurs during runtime. And by runtime here, I mean when the, uh, the code is being executed, for example, in your browser environment. So if your code is not executed, you would not enjoy the benefits of type checking with prop types until your code is being executed, either in development or in production. That's when your, um, your props will be type checked. And then just as we can see here, this is a simple way of declaring your prop types using the prop types library. So you have your component, your function declaration here for your components. And then over here, you have this prop types object with different prop values and then the types. So over here, you have prop types dot string dot is required. This means the BG color prop should be required. So if you use this component without the BG color, you'd get a warning maybe in your console or in the terminal saying that there is a required prop of which you didn't provide. Then you have the app name, prop types dot string. This is optional. You have the items, prop types dot array is required, age, prop types dot number and so on and so forth. So if you had a, maybe an on-click property, you can also have it here and then use the prop types dot funk. Now let's say you're using this component and maybe you pass a number to the BG color instead of a string. In your terminal here, you get the warning, failed prop type, invalid prop, BG color of type number, supply to component, expected string. So this is basically how you'd use prop types for type checking your React application. Now, there's something prop types, you know, like I said earlier, prop types does is type checking during the execution of your code. And this is similar to what prop types does at the background. So you have this if statement here that does something like if type of BG color is not equal to a string, then print this one into the console. So this is similar to what prop types does. And that's why your code has to be executed because if your code is not executed, this if statement would never be executed. So now that's the basics of prop types. Let's look at TypeScript for type checking. Now TypeScript is JavaScript, but with powers or superpowers. And TypeScript is used for static typing JavaScript applications. And static typing in this context here means that you are type checking even without the execution of code. Your code is not executed. You have static data in your code base. And then the TypeScript tools, the TypeScript plugins type checks your props just as it is like that, as a static application. So now props in React are just like regular JavaScript objects, as we saw earlier. And since objects can be typed with, with TypeScript, then component props can also be typed. And this is a basic way of typing props in a React application. So this is, our same, this is the same component here. And then instead of using the prop types, we have this type alias up here, where we have the BG color to be a string. We have the app name to be a string, and then this question mark signifies that it's optional. Then we have these items to have an array of string values. So if for any reason you put a number value in the array, you would get a warning or an error. And then you have the age property, which is optional, and this should be a number. So say, for example, you are using the components and you pass a number instead of a string, you get this 
type warning in your ID saying type number is not assignable to type string. And also, if you run it in your browser, we could check that. If you run it in your browser, you also get the warning for your React application saying you passed the number whereas the string was expected. And let's wait for this to run. So this is this is the code base. I have the declaration over here, BG color, app name, items, and then the age. And then over here, I'm using the components, but I'm passing a number instead of a value. Okay, I would have to change that to JSX. And when the application is run, you can see type number is not assignable to type string. But then when you pass a string here, as long as the other types do not fail, everything works successfully. So that's it for TypeScript, and then we have seen prop types. Now let's look at the similarities between these two. So the first obvious similarity is they are used for type checking. And when you type check with these tools, this helps you to ensure, or it gives a high guarantee that the correct value types are passed into props just as the component expects. So if you are trying to do it to up to a to upper case on a string, there's a high guarantee that you are indeed going to get a string and not a number. And then the second similarity is these tools are used for development and not production. So for your TypeScript, type, because TypeScript gets converted to JavaScript. So your production code does not have any type checking for your props. And then for your prop types too, they only work, they only throw those warnings during development. In production, even if you are violating a type or you are not providing a prop, you would never get those errors in the console. So those are the two major similarities between these tools. And now let's look at the differences. And the differences here, this is the center of this talk. This is the major thing here in this talk. So I'd like us to pay attention. So although these tools are used for type checking, they work in different ways. And these different ways would give you this sense of preference as to why you may want to use TypeScript or why you may want to use prop types. And then some of the notable differences are the first one, runtime versus compile time. The second one is limitation of prop types for typing compared to TypeScript e.g. conditional props. We'll look at that. We'll look at, we'll look at them in detail in the following slides. And then the last difference, which is a bit minor, is the IDE tools provided for TypeScript. Now let's look at the differences in detail. Firstly, runtime versus compile time. Like I've stated earlier, and like we have seen in the definition, prop type does its type checking during runtime. So without the execution of code, type errors cannot be caught. But then on the other hand, TypeScript does type checking during compile time. And compile time is where the, co the code is converted from TypeScript to JavaScript. So during that conversion now, there is no execution. Even if you have a function call, the function would never be called. You are just trying to convert the TypeScript representation of that function to a JavaScript representation. None of the code is executed, but the, and that is the that is when TypeScript does its own type checking. So it uses your static value, it uses your hard-coded value, and then it converts everything to JavaScript. So during that conversion, if it notices a type violation, then it throws an error or a warning. Now, this is the major difference between these tools, and it greatly influences how these tools can be used. And we we'll look at two use cases where one will be preferred over the other. And one of that use case is for example, a data coming from an API. Sorry about that. So one of these use cases, for example, one of these use cases, for example, a data coming from an API. So when you are type checking props using TypeScript, this can only be effective when the props value is hard coded. If the data is coming from an API, you would never be sure if that data is a number or a string, even if you have claimed that this um, data is a number, if the data eventually becomes a string, you would never get a warning. But then unlike prop types, since prop types is just like your regular JavaScript and it is always executed, if you get a different type other than what is expected, you would get the error or the warning in your console. And let's quickly look at that here. So I have this basic example 
here, and that is in the API wrapper. So using the prop types, we are calling on, this is the app. I'm going to rename this to app.js since we're using basic prop types. So this app.js calls this API, this JSON placeholder API, and then it updates the state accordingly. And then it feeds that data into this API wrapper. And in this API wrapper here, we have used prop types to declare the types of our props. And we are receiving a to-do prop, which comes in form of this shape, completed, ID, title, user ID. And now I think I'll also print the data so you can see how the data looks like. And now if I restart this and run again, So if you're not familiar with the API, this is the JSON placeholder API. It's a free API that you can use for testing your tool. So this is what we expect. This is the value we expect in our React components. Now let's see how the component handles it. So we'll go here. Now, as we can see, invalid prop to do dot user ID of type number supplied to API wrapper. That's because in the shape here, we specify that we want a string for the user ID. But then what comes from the API is a number and then we get this warning. This is during runtime while the code is being executed. Now let's look at it using TypeScript. So I would rename this to TSX. I also rename this to TSX. The reason why I'm renaming this to TSX and renaming to JS is I have some TypeScript extensions that sometimes plays, once it is a TypeScript file, it may not, um, it may not interpret it like a JS file. So it begins to throw several warnings, which is uncalled for. So over here, So over here, I have specified that using TypeScript, I've specified that the use state should hold a state of the to-do interface or null. And this is the to-do interface here. It has a completed property, which is a Boolean, an ID property, which is a number, a title, and then a user ID. And then over here, I'll specify props this way. I'll remove this part here, and then I would attach this like this. This is just what we had with prop types, but now we're using TypeScript. And now let's see the error that follows when we run it again. So for our TypeScript here, user ID is a string, but the API returns a number. But just as we would observe, we won't get any warning or any um, error when we receive a string because over here, we have claimed that the user ID is a string. We are telling the API wrapper that the user ID is a string. Even though the user ID is coming from an API, we are assuring this component that the user ID is a string. But then when it becomes a number, we don't get the type, type number is not okay. I need to fix this part here. So I'll just clear off this part. Now we can see the application runs perfectly, no errors, no warnings. And that's because TypeScript only uses static data, hard-coded data during compile time. It doesn't execute any code. So if you tell it you're receiving a number, it assumes you're getting a number, even if that number or that data is coming from an API. And then that's one example. So in such cases here, if you would want to enjoy the benefits of type checking, you may want to prefer prop types to TypeScript in this case. Another scenario is, your mind. So another scenario is, come on, what's happening? Okay, 
some reasons the slides just give me a few minutes to fix that come on Okay, don't know what's happening. Uh, okay, I can no longer see my slides. Sorry. I'll share that again in a minute. Okay, for some reasons, my slides is not coming up. And I'm not sure why. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. So, I'll just present it as it is. And I was here in the differences. So one of the difference here, one of the cases is data coming from an API. And then the second scenario is say you are creating a shared library, a shared JavaScript library. Now, like I said before, your production code does not have TypeScript definition. So even if you are typing your React components with TypeScript, once they are pushed to NPM, the production, the distributed version, they do not have TypeScript definitions. So the users of your library would not enjoy those type checking benefits. But when you're using prop types, since prop types is just like a regular JavaScript, regardless of whoever is using your shared library, they would always get that warning or that error when they violate a type error, when they violate a, a prop type. But then using TypeScript, you can also take the extra step of creating your declaration files and also publishing to NPM so that when your users install your, your React or your library, they can also install the type definitions and then they, they, get the, they enjoy the type checking benefits. But then that's extra work because after creating your library, you have to go ahead to create your declaration files. So if you are creating a shared library like this, you may want to use prop types for your prop types. Now that is one difference. The second difference between prop types and TypeScript is that prop types is limited. Now TypeScript allows for many dynamics, many advanced things that you may want to do regarding types and prop types is limited. For example, if you look at the prop types documentation here, this is all that there is for prop types. These are everything you can do with prop types. But then, like I said, props are just like JavaScript arguments. So uh, you can do everything that TypeScript allows you to do with variables, with objects, one of which is you can create read-only props. And we can quickly check that here. So this place here, I can create a read-only prop called for the user.full name. And if you go over here to try to reassign it, you get that error. With Prop types, you cannot achieve something like this. And that's why prop types is limited. Another way that prop types is limited, another example I want to show us is conditional props. So conditional props is a case where you specify different structures of the properties object depending on another value. And this is how it works. So say we have this here. I think I'll just print all of that here so we can see it well. So let's say we have in this, I'll remove this part here. I'll remove this part here. So let's say we had authenticated and authenticated is false. You can have another variation, authenticated true, and here you want full name to be a string. So this is called conditional props. And what this means is that when you specify an authenticated or false, you're not required to provide any other property. But when you specify an authenticated of true, 
then you are requested to provide a full name and we can look at that being used here so i'll just clean this off i'll give this a string just as it wants i'll give this a string just as the component wants and then i'll give this an array of string and then i'll give this a number okay this is supposed to be call it brace now for the user here if i give it an authenticated I give it an authenticated or false oh, something is wrong here okay yes so if i give it an authenticated or, or false you see that typescript no longer complains because it's not expecting any other property but if i give it an authenticated of true then it throws out a warning saying that i also have to specify the full name property full name is missing so this is conditional props and this is what i love so much this one thing i've done so much with with typescript but with prop types, you'd never be able to do something like this. So prop types is very limited compared to TypeScript. So if you are trying to do very complex things, then you may just have to sacrifice the runtime type checking and then just use TypeScript. And then the last difference, which is a bit minor, is that there are so many ID plugins for TypeScript. Unlike prop types, because prop types has to be executed first, in TypeScript, TypeScript does static typing. So you can just create tools to analyze your source code the way it is and then run the type checking feature on it. So you have so many IDE plugins for TypeScript. And just as you can see here, I've not even gone to, I didn't even have to check my browser to see the type errors or the type warnings. Just right here, I can see it when I violate a type or BG color was required if you remember and over here, I can see it's telling me BG color is missing. So there are so many ID plugins for TypeScript. And if you are looking, if you want to enjoy the benefits of fixing errors while writing code, then you may want to choose TypeScript. Now we have seen the benefit, or now we have seen what prop types means. We have seen what TypeScript means. We have seen the basic ways of using them. But then how do you combine these two? Because for someone like me, I love using TypeScript. But then I may also want to enjoy the runtime type checking benefits. And there are two ways to go about this. There are a few tools you can use. The first tool you can use is infer props. And infer props is a type, it's an export tech type from the prop types library. I think we can look. It's, it's an export tech type from the prop types library. And over here in this Stack Overflow, which has is a mini documentation of it, you can use infer props. From the you have to install this because this contains the type definitions for the prop types package. So you can remove you can use the infer props from this package, and then just the way you see it used here, you import infer props, and then I think we can we can do that here. Do I remember doing it? Okay, I didn't do it for a reason and would found that I'll, I'll let you know in a second. So you can, this is your types, this is your prop types here. And then you can do your type props equals to infer props. And then you are inferring the props from these types here. But the reason why I didn't do it before this presentation is the latest version of TypeScript does this automatically for you. So with the latest versions of TypeScript, even if I use a prop type, here i think i did that here okay i didn't so i'll just pick everything from here this from here so the latest versions of typescript does this for you so you no longer need to import infra props manually so over here i can just declare prop types and I can pick all of these from here, put them here. And I can also, okay, now I just need to use prop types like this. And then that's it. So back here, when we go to the app.tx, when you, I can remove these parts here. So now I do not provide, as you can see here, okay, I need to remove the props definition also. Let me comment this out. So here I'm just using the prop types. I am not using the, 
I didn't need to cut this part. I can just fix it here. I think TypeScript still does. Yep. So I'm no longer using types here. I'm just using the regular prop types. But over here, you can see that property BG color is missing. And if you read between these, you'd see that a, a type called infer props inner, which is also based on infer props, was used to pick the prop types from here and then create a type definition for this component. But if you're not using the latest versions of if you're not using the latest versions of um, of TypeScript, you may have to go the extra step of doing this in fab props. I pick this and put it here. Prop types. And then I'll have to do something like type props equals to in fab props type of prop types. And then I attach it to this. If you know the latest versions of TypeScript, you may have to go the extra step of importing the infer props and then creating your type definitions like this. But like I said, the updated version does this for you. So with infer props, you no longer need to write, since you want to enjoy the benefits of both worlds, you no longer need to write your prop types and then write your type definitions. You can just write only your prop types and then TypeScript and then the infer props handles the rest and makes it um, fit for TypeScript. But there's a limitation here because there's a limitation here when you are trying to do some things that maybe TypeScript is not familiar with, maybe prop types dot shape. It all depends on what the infer prop supports. So if the infer props only support string numbers, that's the highest that you can do. So that is it for infer props. And then the second tool is this Babel plugin called Babel plugin TypeScript to to proto to prop types. Okay, I almost call that prototype. So I have a little challenge here. When I tried using this tool before this presentation, I didn't get it to work. I I think it has something to do with Create React app not allowing my Babel plugins to run as I expect or allowing me to overwrite my Babel plugins. But I'm still leaving this in this slide, still leaving this information in this slide. This is the link here. So you can go through it and maybe it would work for you. Or maybe there's something I'm not doing right that you can do right. But then the purpose of the plugin is for generating prop types from TypeScript type definitions. So just like we saw with the infer props, we specified our prop types and then type definitions were created. With this plugin, you can have your type definitions created, and this will help you generate your prop types, maybe during compilation or during during compilation, of course, maybe during your build or your develop. It will help you generate those prop types. So you no longer need to worry. You no longer need to write the definitions for both types. You just write it for only one, and then this tool fixes the other one for you. But then there are limitations here too, because TypeScript can be very complex, just like we saw with conditional props and then read-only. This plugin, I really don't know how advanced this plugin may be at the moment, but then this plugin may not be able to convert everything to prop types, but you are sure to have the basic type definitions converted to prop types as you would want. And then that brings us to the conclusion of this talk. So. Uh, with all that you may have taken from my talk, this is one thing that I want to stick with you, is that TypeScript runs its prop type checking during compilation while the code is converted from TypeScript to JavaScript using Webpack, using Babel, whatever tool you may be using, Create React App, whatever framework, it does its type checking during compilation. And in contrast, prop types does its own type checking during runtime, during the execution, of code. And this is what makes the tools different from each other. And this is what makes them unique in their own way. And that's it for TypeScript versus prop types. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear. Dillian, thank you so much. Um, that was quite a useful talk, uh, especially for React devs working with um, TypeScript or coming into TypeScript. It can seem confusing, really making that distinction between runtime and uh, compile time. Compile check. time. So thank yeah. you for that journey through that with all of the examples. Um,
Now, let's see if we have any questions. I don't see any questions coming mm. in. And uh, if none come in, then uh, I'd use this moment to thank you once again, Dillian. Oh, okay, there we go. We have a question from David B. Uh, and that is, will Dino make the use of prop types obsolete while using natively TypeScript at runtime? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm not quite familiar with how Dino works, but as long as Dino can make TypeScript work at runtime, then I think you may not need um, a tool similar to prop types. Of course, prop types is for React, but let's say there is a runtime type checking tool for regular JavaScript. If there is native support for TypeScript at runtime, you may not need that tool. Mm -hmm. The main reason why you may want to use prop types is because TypeScript does its uh, type checking at compile time and not at runtime. So if Deno supports that, then you may not need an extra tool. Yeah, I believe I we hope. also had a talk about uh, converting, actually taking types and generating runtime checks out of types. So doing it sort of the other way, instead of generating types from prop types, uh, doing it the other way, taking the type and generating a validator object uh, from that. Um, so uh, I can definitely drop the link to that. I think it was Emma Serino who gave that talk at one of the previous ones. Um, okay, uh, great talk. Any recommendations how to convert, okay, JS components with prop types to TS props in bulk? Uh, okay, I do not have any recommendation for this. I want to believe that there may be tools online, maybe a Maybe a plugin or maybe a website where you feed your code and then it brings the uh, TS definitions. But I'm really not sure of any. My best solution for this is you would have to, wait, from prop types to TypeScript, okay, my best definition for this is once you update to the, to the current, to the latest TypeScript, I believe the latest TypeScript does this for you using the infer props that I mentioned earlier. So you just have to update the whole of the application to TypeScript using the latest TypeScript versions and integrate it with your React application. If you're not using Create React app, you may have to go the extra step of ensuring that they are coupled correctly together. And once you do that, I believe your TS definition should, should be intact, yes. All right. Uh, Dillian, thank you once again and hope to see you at a future meetup. Yes, thanks for having me. And I hope my session was helpful for React devs and TypeScript devs in general. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I'd like to make a short introduction to Prisma. So as some of you know, uh, Prisma is... Uh, an open source ORM for Node.js and TypeScript. And I think that, uh, so uh, this is a TypeScript meetup and, and Prisma is, a, is really heavily invested in TypeScript because we want to provide uh, a great uh, developer experience when working with um, your database. And so Prisma supports three languages currently, JavaScript, TypeScript, and Go, and Go, the Go client is in early access. Uh, so you can test that out if you're a Go user. But the sort of the background, the framing for this is that working with relational databases is a major bottleneck in application development. And the database almost uh, always is one of the most critical components in your application. Uh, and so when working with relational databases, you know, you have the option of using a uh, raw SQL or you um, query builders or ORMs and ORMs have quite a, a a, uh, a bad reputation, especially some of the active record ORMs due to the complex objects that uh, uh, can make it quite difficult to reason about how you're interacting with your data. Um, also debugging SQL queries and getting type safety for uh, raw SQL is not so um, straightforward. And so Prisma makes it easy for developers to reason about their database queries by providing a clean and uh, type safe API for submitting database queries and all of these database queries return just plain old JavaScript objects. And so right now, Prisma supports uh, four databases, and those are MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft SQL, and SQLite. And Prisma is really comprised of three main components. Prisma Client, that is this intuitive and type-safe ORM for interacting with your database. 
This is automatically generated for you based on your database schema. And that is also what provides you really this full type safety. The second uh, component is Prisma Migrate, and that is a database migration tool that allows you to model your database schema declaratively and still have full control by generating uh, SQL migrations. And um, this was just launched uh, to, for production use recently, uh, and we've been getting some really good feedback. Um, and finally, Prisma Studio, and that is a modern database GUI for interacting with your data. And so at the core of Prisma is this Prisma schema. And uh, this is this declarative uh, uh, configuration file where, uh, where you define your app's data models and their relations uh, in a human readable. And uh, this is also the configuration file from which these migrations are generated. So a good way to think about the Prisma schema is that it's a single source of truth for your database schema and your Prisma setup. It's also used as a single source of truth for Prisma client, which is generated for you. Um, and uh, there are really two core benefits to Prisma, increased productivity and confidence. And uh, Prisma achieves these benefits in a bunch of different ways. Uh, I mentioned the first one is thinking in objects. So instead of mapping relational data, you can uh, you have very predictable sort of return type for every query that you make and you can verify that at compile time the second thing is uh the focus with prisma is on queries rather than classes so uh you avoid a lot of these complex model objects that you have in um, sort of active record style orms the third is i mentioned this a couple of times uh, and that is type safe database database queries so all of your uh, prisma client calls uh, have an associated type and that type can change based on the fields that you select in your query. And of course you have the single source of truth, which is human readable. And that was the Prisma schema that I showed. And so it's worth mentioning that this is designed for building APIs. You can use this to build microservices. You can use this to do a lot of things that involve interaction with a database. Uh, and when it comes to APIs, of course, REST and GraphQL are the obvious ones. And what you see here is an example of a query um, on a post model. So that uh, corresponds to a post table in a relational database. And uh, this is just a find many where um, there is some um, offset based uh, pagination here and an order by. Um, and uh, we've been getting really good feedback about you know Prisma's usage with TypeScript. Um, and uh, if you haven't already, I uh, highly recommend you to check it out. Now, uh, Dr. Steven Jensen has recently published this course, End to End React with Prisma 2. It is a full stack course that is available on Udemy and you can access it free of charge by entering this code. I uh, will also drop this code and the link to the course in the chat. Um, and the discount code will be active for the next three days. So just uh, if you don't intend on doing this immediately, you can just sign up now um, and then you'll be able to access it. Now, um, one extra thing is that if you're interested in learning more and really diving deep, uh, we're hosting a free introductory Zoom workshop tomorrow. That is uh, Thursday. And uh, the workshop is really dedicated to newcomers. So no pre previous Prisma experience or knowledge is necessary. We'll also drop a link to that in the YouTube chat. And that will be led by our very own Nicholas Burke. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he's a great, great instructor. And um, um, I always just really enjoy working, uh, learning from him. Now, finally, we also have uh, a small announcement to make, and that is that Prisma Day is happening this year. And this will be the third edition of Prisma Day, our two-day community-focused online conference on modern application development and databases. And you can already sign up to stay updated. We'll also drop a link to that in the YouTube chat. Um, and if you haven't attended already uh, in previous years, I can highly recommend this. Also, I'm sure that there's many of you in the audience who are uh, probably familiar with, uh, uh, with Prisma already and have done some really interesting things. So if you're interested, also feel free to reach out if you're interested in giving a talk. Um, we're constantly uh, learning about sort of new cases and new integrations and uh, really interesting things that uh, folks are doing with Prisma. So yeah. Uh, 
Now, uh, we also have another meetup, which will take place on the 6th of May. And we will host Guy Royce, uh, who will present his fun Dungeons and Dragons themed introduction to graph databases. We'll also have Julieta Curdy talk about Prisma's developer experience. We'll have Andy Woods and Adam Storm from Cockroach Labs, who will give a talk titled The Future is Multi-Region. And uh, in case you're not familiar, Cockroach is uh, sort of like um, a Postgres compatible a uh, database that is uh, built for sort of cloud native era. It's sort of like a, a scalable and distributed uh, a variant of um, of Postgres that is uh, heavily influenced by Google Spanner. So uh, that will be really interesting. And now I would like to run a small quiz. So um, this is your chance to um, uh, participate and answer and the questions are going to be related to Prisma and so uh, get ready and I'm going to open up the first question and that is which language is not supported by Prisma? We've already got two votes coming in and six. I'll keep this open for a couple more moments. Quick reminder, we have three prizes for the first, uh, for the three winners. The first one is a JetBrains license. The second is uh, a 50 lessons with TypeScript book. And then the third is a Prisma swag pack. And so I'm going to close this question in a couple of seconds. And, oh, that's weird. Okay, my uh, Slido is acting up. Let me see if I can fix this and activate the question. I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, so excuse me. Um, let's see. And, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry about this. And uh, let's see if I can activate this question. And it seems like I can't. And uh, okay, and then I've activated the um, Prisma question. I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but you should be able to participate in that. Let's see. Okay, it just says get ready. Oh, no, it's, uh, it seems to be working. Uh, it's probably just a Google Slides integration. Um, and let's see if we can get the results for this. And I'm going to show the results. And the correct answer was obviously Prisma MyWay, which just recently reached um, a general availability. And then for... Not sure why this is. Nope. Okay. Hmm. All right. Maybe we can load up the leaderboard. Okay. I'm having some difficulties here. I think we can use this moment to move on and we'll try to fix this in the break and, uh, now I would like to oh. now I'd like to introduce our final speaker. One moment. Okay, so our final speaker for tonight, and that is Kaitan. Um, and Kaitan is a former construction engineer and he's now building software instead. He works as a front end developer at SoftServe and he loves learning new things and sharing his findings with others via tech talks and articles. So on that note, I'd love to welcome Kaitan to the stage. Hello, Kaitan. Hi, hello. Do you see Am me? I, Do you hear me? I hear you, I see you. Um, mm -hmm. Are you ready to share your screen, maybe? Oh, okay, yeah, it's getting dark. Okay, yeah, it's getting dark here. Uh, okay, I am sharing my screen. So 
So hopefully you can see it now. Yeah, we can. Okay. All right, the stage is yours. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today I'd like to tell you some things about Elm. And before that, I'd like to start with sharing uh, with you some personal story of mine. And this is a story of how, how I was uh, fascinated with uh, functional programming to begin with. And this story took place around two years ago on my uh, local TypeScript meetup in my city of Wrocław. And then uh, the, the theme of the meetup was uh, functional programming. And uh, there were two talks. One of them was about uh, Marble.js, that is a TypeScript library for creating backends with TypeScript, RxJS, and uh, mm, functional reactive programming paradigm. And the other one was uh, about how static typing help uh, solving basic functional programming um, principles like uh, function composition. And I remember, remember from back, back then that I understood maybe a 10% of what was said. And this was for two reasons. First one was that beforehand, I didn't really know what functional programming really was. And the second one was at that time, I had only maybe a six months of experience as a developer, like a professional experience in my first job, and also a six months of experience with TypeScript. So sometimes even if some intermediate topics of, of TypeScript were mentioned, I couldn't quite grasp those yet fully. And I remember from that, back, from that time that something really wonderful happened because I wasn't discouraged by this uh, confusion of mine, this lack of knowledge, but I was fascinated by the new things I like to do. I like, mm, mm, I, uh, sorry, the new things that I could learn and the, by the puzzle itself. So I remember just rushing back home as soon as I can and just reading articles, uh, watching video tutorials, etc., about uh, functional programming. And I think that this adventure of mine with FP continues to this day. And you can treat this, uh, treat this presentation as a sum up of my first year of learning functional programming in a JavaScript ecosystem. And with this talk, I'd like to present you why I think that Elm is a delightful language for learning functional programming. Uh, of course, I was already introduced, but all, uh, I want to just say that uh, if you want to follow my work, you can uh, you can uh, see me on Twitter at KaitanSW or on my blog Kaitan.dev. So today I'd like to start with something general. I'd like to sell you functional programming and tell you why should you even be interested in this paradigm. Then I'll tell you what is Elm. Why should you at least try it? Of course, this is a TypeScript meetup. So I added a section when, where I uh, compare all th those two technologies, Elm and TypeScript. And at the end, I'd like to just, uh, mm, tell you about alternatives to Elm, so other FP languages that compile to JavaScript. So why should you be even interested in functional programming? I think if you ask any functional programmer uh, what is the basic principle or the basic block of the uh, FP language, those would be pure functions. And those are called like that before because of two reasons. First one is that uh, for, for the same input, they always return the same output. And the second one, they, that they don't have any side effects. And I'd like to th I like to think about side effects as any operation that requires accessing to some external resources, like external resources to the function scope itself. So whenever we have to grab some data via HTTP, or read something from a file or write something to a console or even grab some variable that is outside of a function scope that is 
something that it's, it's possible for example in JavaScript, that is, uh, that is considered a side effect. So you could ask how exactly should we create our programs in functional programming paradigm if we have, if our pure functions cannot have side effects. And there is even a, a joke in a function programming community that, uh, community that if you get rid of any side effects from, uh, from our programs, the biggest thing we could do is to heat up our computers. And this is quite true. And this is because languages like Haskell or Elm have their own way to handle side effects. For Haskell, those are monads. And for Elm, it is something different. And I'll explain what exactly later. So the next principle is immutability. Um, let's consider we have some array and we'd like to add something to it or remove from something from it, or we have some object that we have, uh, that we want to update field there. In the functional, in, in, in principle of immutability, we wouldn't update the, the data structure itself at some reference, but we, but we would uh, create a copy of this data structure with the updated piece of it. And I think mutability and immutability is a pretty debatable subject, uh, pretty much because it has its advantages and disadvantages. We can, we can think of disadvantages of immutability as uh, it might be not uh, as performant as it can be, because just let, let's imagine uh, making some op uh, operation heavy update on, on some quite large data structure. But I'd like to just point out that functional programming languages like Haskell or, or Elm choose immutability of data structures. The next one is easier testing. And I think this is a consequence of the last two principles. So pure functions and immutability. And this is because with those two, we can uh, treat our programs, which is composed of all the pure functions as deterministic, deterministic as in uh, math functions. So we can easily, uh, uh, easily predict the behavior that for of our functions or our program. So the, hence, they are uh, easier to test. The next one is constant growth. Constant growth in terms of the languages themselves, all the tooling around them, uh, the community itself, the learning resources, the job market needs, etc. Some time ago, we wouldn't even think uh, about languages like Haskell as something production ready, maybe, uh, because not many uh, companies were using them. They were considered as languages that is that were used strictly for academia. And right now, there is a lot of demand for. FP developers and uh, experts in FP field, and more and more companies use those uh, to create their, their own products. The same thing is with learning FP. Uh, if you want, some time ago you would only consider some uh, enormous heavy books with category theory, and everyone would tell you that category theory is the only thing that uh, is the only thing that you should do to uh, before learning Haskell or other FP languages. But right now we have so many resources, so many to, so many uh, tutorials, videos, etc. that with many different approaches to it. So we can just pick one and start learning. And the last thing I think that functional programming broadens your mind. And I remember that in my case, when I started learning functional programming and was reading all those principles, I felt like my uh, a different sections of my brain was just started to being used because uh, I I was my background is from object oriented programming. Uh, this is what was taught to me at my university at my first work, and I was just quite excited to uh, experience this new puzzle. So what exactly is Elm? Like the first page of the 
of the language itself. Uh, it says that Elm is a delightful language for reliable web applications. So Elm is a FP language that compiles to JavaScript and it, it is designed and created strictly for creating web applications. So you cannot create, you use it to create backends, systems, etc. only web applications. Why should you at least, at least try Elm? Well, the first thing is that uh, learning Elm would give you all the advantage of the FP world that I've mentioned. So pure functions, immutability, easier testing, constant, uh, constant growth of uh, the um, Elm ecosystem, um, language, uh, Elm tooling libraries, etc. And also learning it, of course, broadens your mind. Now let's consider two worlds, the world of easy and hard uh, languages. So easy and hard, it's really a relative thing and uh, maybe subjective thing because uh, uh, one thing, what means easy? Easy means that uh, you can, it's the time, the amount of time that you need to uh, take to grab a language you don't know learn the basics of it and do something meaningful with it. So uh, it's of course very uh, subjective. One person can learn a language in two days and other person can learn it in two weeks. And I would, I'll be talking in this example uh, about three languages and I just wanted to compare the easiness or uh, the easiness of those three languages. Uh, but just I just want to stick or uh, to some overall statistics that I've seen before. So in this example, I would consider an easy uh, language as uh, uh, the JavaScript, the easy language. And of course, JavaScript isn't so easy, but if we compare it with Haskell, it's quite easy. If we, for example, compare uh, the Hello World example of both, uh, for JavaScript, we need to only know that there is something like console log function and we provide some argument to it to write to a console, but with Haskell, despite the fact that Hello World in Haskell is quite easy to write, it has uh, quite few uh, characters to write, uh, you touch some uh, unknown abstractions like monad. So where in this, um, where in this example Elm lives? I think it lives in the middle of those both worlds because uh, it's quite easy to adopt. It was designed so that uh, it could be easily adopted, especially for um, developers experience with JavaScript, because it's some, it has some quite familiar uh, syntax and uh, features. And from Haskell, it adopts uh, pure functions, immutability, and some useful data structures that, has, that are known for uh, functional programmers. The next interesting thing about Elm is Elm architecture. And this is the, uh, the architecture created for Elm that, um, that tell us how to structure the internal state of our applications and how events are passed through and uh, how the events are used within our application. So everything starts with a model and model is a, just a type and you can, um, you can compare it with, with the concept of state in some state management libraries like NGRX for Angular or Redux. And then we have a view, which is represented with a view function that is built in into Elm. And view function takes a current model as an argument and returns a template that should be rendered to the user. From the view, um, from the scope of view, we can send something called message uh, messages that is that can be compared to state management libraries uh, actions. For example, you have some button with the on-click event, and then we then we can byte some some message 
that we define ourselves. And th this message when sent is captured by the update function. And update is a function that takes the captured message, the current model, and returns a new model. And within the mm, life, cy life cycle of our application, the, this, uh, this uh, graph goes on and on and on. There is also something called Elm runtime, and this is something like a black box that we are not allowed to touch, and but this is something that we can talk with. And Elm runtime is a, is a concept that let us deal with side effects within, within Elm applications. So, for example, if we want to cre create a, do a HTTP request, we send, send some specific command that is captured by the Elm runtime. Elm runtime does its operation, does a request, and uh, waits for the response. And uh, when the response of this example HTTP request is, uh, is, is captured, the Elm runtime sends a message this in, at the process goes like previously. The message is captured by update and the new model is created. So that, now I'd like to tell you how, uh, show you just example, um, the, mm, the simplest example of Elm application there is, a counter application. So as a model in this counter application, we have a uh, counter we have two buttons and one button one button for incrementing the counter and the second one to decrement the counter so our model in this example is just a simple integer and the built-in init function allows us to initiate our model so in this case it's zero and there's a view function that takes a current model and and returns a uh, a template and the template is represented by uh, of course HTML elements and HTML elements are represented by specific functions and all of those functions for all elements are structured so as the first argument they take a list of attributes and the second one uh, the second argument is a list of children so in this example we have uh, uh, we have a div that contains a button, text, and the next button. Uh, notice for the uh, notice that for the buttons we bind uh, messages to them. So there are two types of messages represented by uh, the sum type, or in TypeScript it, it's called union, and it's a increment and a decrement. And the update function takes the mess captured message, captured message, the current model, and based on the using case statement, we can, uh, um, based on the message, create a new model. And the next thing is something that absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent sold me on Elm, and this is this was a promise of no runtime errors and no no or undefined and this is something that totally blew my mind when i her first heard of it because i was quite fed up at the time with all those no pointer exceptions and uh, errors like type error cannot find field name of undefined or something like that i'm pretty much fed up with those <laughs> also now but uh, nevertheless uh, how elm achieves those uh, it achieves, the, achieves those uh, with a very strict type system and also some additional features like, for example, decoders. And decoders or uh, JSON decoders or ARM decoders, well, uh, they are used, for example, in uh, creating a GET request. For that, we can use a GET method built, that is built in, in the HTTP uh, module it takes url and it takes uh, something called expect within which we uh, we specify which exactly data structure we want to uh, we expect as a return of uh, of the request so the body of the response 
So in this example, in this imaginary application, when we want to fetch some hero data, uh, we expect a JSON structure as a return. Then we can, for this, it is represented in a, by the uh, expect JSON function. Then we pass the message that should be sent by the uh, Elm runtime where the request is finished. And also the Elm decoder. And Elm decoder is just a, fu is just a function composed of many atomic decoders because the, in Elm there are atomic decoders, for example, primitive data types like string, boolean, integer, etc. And there are decoders for composing small decoders into bigger ones like a list of something or uh, records or dictionary. So we have to, uh, whenever we talk with the outside world, we have to provide uh, Elm decoder to communicate with Elm compiler or Elm runtime that this is the, the specific data structure that we want to uh, get as a return. And I talk about that because in TypeScript, uh, we are not quite forced, forced in a good way, I think, uh, forced in, into creating, uh, into covering the failure scenario of our fetch request requests. So if we are using, for example, fetch API to fetch something, we just, um, we just declare that this, uh, uh, this uh, structure that we get as a return uh, would be this and this. But what if our uh, this API that we are uh, sending requests to our, are out of our control? So they are um, they are maintained by some other team or are um, or, or are uh, completely external like uh, Google Maps API. So if the API changes, we would get some runtime errors and our applications would probably blow up and we wouldn't know exactly why. And we because we wouldn't just cover uh, this failure uh, case. And now the battle of giants, so Elm versus TypeScript. And I think it's fair to just point out at the beginning that those are those are fundamentally different uh, technologies because Elm is a full-blown functional programming language that is compiled to JavaScript, whereas the TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. So it's a, like an extension to the existing language. So the first thing is that Elm prevents run runtime data inconsistency, like API changes, and TypeScript not exactly uh, because it didn't it doesn't force us to cover those uh, examples. Like I said, forces. I th when I use word forces, it I mean it in a good way because it results uh, in the end in safer applications. And this is because the, uh, this is because uh, the the other, this disadvantage comes from the nature of uh, JavaScript as a dynamic language, but can be uh, compensated by using some libraries like IOTS or Zot for creating some something called runtime types within TypeScript. The next thing is that in uh, in Elm, there is no concept of null or undefined. Those are uh, represented by types like maybe. And in TypeScript, there are null and undefined. And it also comes from JavaScript. The next thing is immutability. Uh, Elm does, uh, has it, TypeScript doesn't. But like I pointed earlier, type, uh, immutability can be used uh, for the greater good, for the greater good, uh, for example, for optimizing some operations on la larger data structures, and also we can compensate those uh, those need for immutable data structures by using some additional libraries uh, uh, like Emer. In Elm, there is no uh, concept of any or unknown. Uh, like in TypeScript, but I think also 
it also comes with, from the nature of JavaScript, but um, and it can be used in good things uh, because it was uh, created for for projects that are steadily migrating from JavaScript and TypeScript. Okay, the next thing. Um, I think that Elm prevents poor typing from third party libraries that we would like to use in our applications, strictly because all those mechanism like, mechanisms like decoders I've mentioned, and also the overall strict uh, typing of Elm. And in TypeScript, let's be honest, uh, that's uh, it's very easy for uh, library authors for to just convert uh, all uh, files with, from JS to TS and don't add, and don't add any types to TypeScript, and everything is just any, and they they could very well publish this as a library. I, and I think at the end, all tech, all, mm, both those technologies are easy to adopt in existing project. In TypeScript, all we have to do is uh, uh, change the extension from GS, uh, JS to TS and add types. Of course, I tell you that's just the case, but uh, sometimes it's not that easy. But uh, in uh, Elm, it's uh, easy because we can create an Elm application within our project and just specify a concrete uh, HTML element the, and there the Elm application would be rendered. I also wanted to mention some um, TypeScript libraries that can be used to write uh, functional uh, functionality. Uh, with TypeScript, and those are, for example, FPTS, which I think is the the biggest library with the richest ecosystem for uh, functional programming within TypeScript. It also has some, I would say, plugin-based library ecosystem, like many libraries with many extensions, and something uh, uh, different, uh, and I mean uh, FPTS, that is also a FP library that is uh, inspired by Zio. And fun fact, the uh, on the previous TypeScript Berlin meetup, the author of FT FPTS had this had his uh, talk about FPTS, and I recommend it to you to watch it. And uh, other languages that compile to JavaScript. And I've picked only a few, uh, the most intriguing, in my opinion. The first one is Rescript, is, uh, and it's a FP language that is created by Facebook. The second one is PureScript, and it's my favorite, favorite right now, and it's something that I dove, uh, that I dove into some, some time ago. And I would... Um, I would think about type about pure script as a Haskell in JavaScript ecosystem. So it's a language that is heavily inspired by Haskell. And the next thing is Scala with Scala.js. Of course, Scala is not pure functional programming language, but I mention it just because uh, it has very, very big uh, functional programming community. Uh, the next is our examples of uh, Elm apps that I want to present that I wanted to present to you because I think that real learning by examples uh, example is something that uh, some of you may enjoy. On the left, you can find a QR code for my own Elm survey app that I've uh, created strictly for this uh, presentation, and it takes you through some simple survey. The next thing is real world example app, and it's a pretty brilliant initiative that is a, a, that is a clone of existing Medium platform, and it's implemented across multiple repositories in different technologies, uh, separately front end and separately back end. So, for example, if you want to check out uh, the front end of this application in Elm and back end with, I don't know, Elixir or Express.js or something like that. You can 
Uh, you can download those repositories and uh, connect those and play with those. And I think that might be a good approach if you are familiar with, uh, for example, Angular or React, you can download uh, the real world application in, this, uh, in those technologies and create uh, and download application in L and just compare those, how those work with the same application. And there's also an interactive playground within the uh, main Elm Lang page. Also, I wanted to share with you some learning resources that I've used for learning Elm. So uh, for, uh, as the first one is a beginning Elm. It's uh, quite nice and uh, uh, quite nice and big uh, tutorial with creating uh, some example application along the way. There's also uh, official docs. There's an awesome Elm on GitHub, and this is just a list of tutorials, articles, videos, etc. And you can pick one of those and start learning. And at the end, uh, there is a talk by Ivan Chatlitsky, and he is uh, author of Elm. And uh, in this talk, he presents you with some design choices for Elm. And that's it from my side. And thank you all for listening. And thank, thank you also for organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Kaitan. Uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, I think there's also interesting questions um, in the chat. Um, yeah, I think the, the first one I think that comes to mind when I was learning Redux a while back, and this is a question that I think came from Tristan Lucas was um, if you could compare some part of the Elm runtime to a Redux uh, reducer, is it, is it a fair statement to even say that Redux was heavily influenced by uh, the sort of the Elm way of handling side effects? Mm, okay, I didn't... Uh... Mentioned it. I wanted to mention it as a fun fact, but uh, mm, Elm is uh, like Redux is inspired by Flux architecture, and Flux architecture was inspired by Elm. So there is a connection between those. And if you want to compare uh, Redux reducers to something from Elm, I would uh, compare it with the update function because it also deals with messages like the reducer deals with uh, actions. Mm -hmm. Got it. And when it comes to, you, you spoke a lot about the, the role of immutability and the importance. Are there any parallels between um, sort of the uh, immutable data structures in Elm and the kind of like persistent immutable data structures that you have in something like Clojure and Clojure script? Or am I thinking about it the wrong way? Mm, I don't quite know how to answer this question. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Let's keep it. Um, uh, let's see. We I think we also had an interesting question um, from Jakub. Why Elm not pure script? Um, pure script shall not be only limited to the web. Okay. I've I've created this uh, talk strictly because I think I thought that uh, Elm is. Uh, and was cool, at least for me, as a language to start fun learning functional programming. And uh, before I started diving into it, I was uh, thinking about all those alternatives like uh, like PureScript and Elixir and other languages. But I picked Elm strictly because it's so quite easy to pick up. And it was created and designed such, as such a language to be quickly uh, picked up, especially for JavaScript developers. So that's why I've picked it up. And PureScript is quite more, uh, quite more difficult because uh, all of those uh, math abstractions that is going on like uh, monads, etc. So I didn't want to dive into those. I wanted to di dive into uh, the, mo the more basic uh, concepts. And that's why after learning uh, Elm for some time, I started diving and uh, just reading articles and reading even a pure script book to just learn pure script because like you, like the commander said, uh, pure script, it's true. It's not also limited to the front end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's, it's and... quite, sorry, it, it's also quite more challenging for my mind and just that's why I picked it up also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just that I, I imagine that would be like sheer pragmatism. Um, so, uh, what are some of the, what are the most difficult Elm concepts or syntax to grasp when we transition from TS to Elm? Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. If I, mm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember the, the mindset of, of person learning Elm. So I think the most difficult concept for me was to concept of uh, dealing with messages and also with Elm runtime. I was pretty, a little bit confused about those, but, and also decoders. Yeah. I think decoders was, uh, the Elm decoders was quite also difficult to grasp for me at least. Mm -hmm. And are you using Elm in production in any capacity? No, this is this was uh, the Elm was used by me only as a learning resource, I guess. I just wanted to play with it a little and learn maybe a FP principles more than a, a language itself. So I, the for example, the only application ever uh, that I've created is this Elm survey that I've uh, that I've posted in my uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, well, I'd say let's jump into the quiz. Hopefully it's working by now. Uh, do you want to stick around for the quiz? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, okay. So get ready. Um, and we're going to open up the first question and that is Elm is a language that is used for creating systems, mobile applications, web applications, or backends. We've already got one answer four answers. Okay, I'll wait a couple more seconds and I'll close it now. And uh, most of you picked web applications, which was the correct answer. And so we have Andre D who's leading followed by Kuba and Logesh. Um, this is the last question of the quiz. I think it might be, I think, did we have two or three questions? Let me, I've sent them. three questions. Okay. So there might be another question. So stick around. So this is the last question of the quiz. Elm deals with side effects with the Elm runtime, Elm side effects, Elm magic or Elm black box. Okay. And I'm going to close it in a second. And most of you picked Elm runtime and indeed that was the correct answer. And, uh, we still have Andre is leading followed by Kuba and Logesh. And finally, this is indeed the final question, which is which of the following is a trait of a functional programming languages, um, shiny functions, flavored functions, pure functions or dirty functions. And I'll close it in five. And indeed, most of you picked pure functions. And so, um, we have a winner and that is Andre D. So, uh, that will be followed by Kuba and Logesh. I'm inviting you to, uh, reach out to either me or Natalia, um, and, uh, we'll get you the awards, uh, on that note, Kaitan. I'd really like to thank you once again for giving this insightful talk. And, uh, I think it was also really interesting to see, um, how Elm compares to some of the, uh, constructs in, um, in, um, um, TypeScript that is, um, so I hope to see you again and I wish you a nice evening and to the viewers who've joined us, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you again at the next TypeScript meetup.